we are all very human and fallible, and yet we live in a society that rewards pretending we're not fallible, or the range of acceptable fallibility is narrow. We are constantly comparing our insides to other people's outsides and feeling inadequate and guilty, even ashamed. Trying to blend in means parts of ourselves must disappear, and we must then live in fear that we will be found out. Here, together, we will create a space where we can laugh, cry, and carry our suffering and hurts lightly in the service of being deeply human. This is Life's Dirty Little Secrets. Welcome. I'm Chris McCurry. And I'm Emma Waddington. And today we have the wonderful Emily Edlin. Emily is a clinical psychologist. She's an academic, an author, and also a podcast host of one of my favorite podcasts. And today we're here to talk about her recently released book, Autonomy Supportive Parenting. And I'm particularly excited to talk about it because it's just been released on the 5th of September. And today, I think in particular, because we're on Life's Dirty Little Secret and we like to talk about things that perhaps we don't openly discuss, perhaps we can start with the history of parenting. I I love that bit in your book where you discuss the trends, the parenting trends, and how we have ended up in the current trend, which is much more about this helicopter parenting, which has almost become the norm. So how about you kick us off with telling us a little bit about what you discovered, because you are the expert in this. Sure. And I'm really happy to be here and talk with both of you. So thank you for inviting me. I will credit Jennifer Senior's book, All Joy and No Fun, who does a really nice deep dive into the history of parenting that then I sort of summarized and distilled for the context of my book. But yeah, it is really interesting to look back at the trends and how we got to this current era that I think we can all admit we've become more involved. And in some ways, that's a positive. But And I know we don't like the term helicopter parenting, and some of us may think, well, I'm not a helicopter parent, but I would call it intensive parenting. And I Mm -hmm. think that really is what most parents are doing these days, and the surveys and polls support that. But it's like we can't even see past our heavy involvement of how intensive that really is and that it really does still look like, quote unquote, helicopter parenting. So just to go back, I, you know, many of us who are parenting today grew up in the 80s, and I constantly have conversations with other parents around, you know, I was a latchkey kid, and I came home after school, and my parents were working, and I did my homework and made my snack and, you know, entertained myself until they got home. And if you think about it these days, that's like, that's more the exception than the rule. And... I think in the 90s, from what I can gather, there was there was actually this research done about self-esteem that that really scared parents around not giving their child enough attention and praise and how that would destroy their self-esteem in the future. And so that is one piece that has been documented as changing some of the parenting trends is this is this huge focus on self-esteem that ended up being, as often happens in the media with science, overblown, you know, Mm. and not quite as, you know, clear and straightforward as it seemed. And we've learned since that too much praise isn't a good thing. So anyways, there was that piece. And then, you know, I think the whole, there's a lot of fear-based media and with the advent in the early 2000s of everything being more online and accessible and scary headlines, I think parenting has fallen prey, just like many areas of our culture and society, to really a lot of fear-mongering. And just one example is the fear of kidnapping. And the Mm -hmm. statistics show that it's highly unlikely for a child to be kidnapped by a stranger. Yet, that is usually the reason parents don't want their kids wandering the neighborhoods, walking home from school, you know, staying home alone, things like that. 
that actually can be really good for our kids in terms of developing their independence. So I think there's this confluence, right, of, of this emphasis on really building up our kids and being really connected to our kids and making sure that they have, they feel good about themselves. And that was the whole, like, everyone gets a trophy movement that now we kind of laugh mm-hmm. at, but I think it's still mm-hmm. infiltrating mm-hmm. and the fear, which has mm-hmm. heightened even now, you know, even before the pandemic and since the pandemic, I think there's a lot of fear-based parenting guidance specifically like memes on Instagram about if you're not playing with your kid, like you aren't building a close, healthy relationship. And these little bite-sized pieces that we know from the science are not true, yet it puts a heavy burden on parents, especially mothers who are following these guidance more closely usually. But to, that we are supposed to be constantly available and constantly responsive and accessible to our kids at all times. And everything we do should be good for our kids and we shouldn't have mm-hmm. conflict. I mean, there's all these unrealistic mm-hmm. expectations being promoted by social media. And so I think we're all kind of stressed. We're stressed out right. as parents and Especially. doing our best, but kind of now we're operating from a place of fear and anxiety in our parenting rather than a place of calm and confidence. I love this. I love this because it just makes so much sense. I had never really put it all together so neatly like you did in your book and how you've synthesized it today. But it's this kind of, like you said, the confluence between the sense of overinflated sense of responsibility for their self-esteem and their well-being, their psychological sort of outcomes, how well they'll do, which leads to tremendous amounts of guilt. And then the kind of the fear and the anxiety of potentially failing at, you know, developing this incredible self-esteem, this mastery, this resilience, this kind of long list of abilities they're supposed to have, but also to keep them protected and safe. And that it all falls on our shoulders. And, And I can see how you know, parenting has been so much about avoiding feeling guilt and anxiety more than actually savoring um, the relationship or enjoying the process because it's so hard to enjoy it under that kind of duress, under that kind of pressure. Yes. And, And to that, I would even add that I think calm is overrated because if we're trying to stay calm all the time <laughs> and not show any emotion, what message does that send to the kids? You know, emotions are dangerous and, you know, we all have to like suppress all this stuff or, or whatever. Being not calm in, in the right way can actually be instructive. Thank you, Chris, for saying that. I see memes every day and articles about how we need to just stay calm when our child is upset. And I don't think that's good for everybody. It's invalidating. Yeah. And it's not human. You know, we're not embracing and accepting our own humanity to feel like we need to always be calm in response to our child's dysregulation. No, I I call it whole body validation where, you know, if our child's upset, you know, about something, you can go, wow, you're really angry right now wow, talk to me, you know, and you're, you're mm-hmm. showing some affect that kind of matches mm-hmm. there so that they, you know, mirror neurons and all this stuff, you yep. know, they get that you get them on a real, you know, they feel felt yep. and uh, it really leads to them being able to f- settle down because their message has been, you know, received. But if it's like, I understand you're upset, you know, it's like totally invalidating. Well, and I'm just going to say in my own parenting journey as a psychologist specializing in children, Mm -hmm. so allegedly I would be prepared, right? Understanding child development. Tell me about it. (laughs) I'm human like everyone else. And there are times that I react, you know, and I get into it with my kid. And even in the moment, I'll be thinking, well, this isn't really effective, but it doesn't always have to be. I think we need to yes, just kind of let that go totally. because uh, it's yes. also about the relationship. And I think our mm-hmm. kids can learn from our reactions sometimes mm-hmm. that, 
okay, when I say these terrible things to my mom, she gets upset. Like mm-hmm. that's a thing to learn. And of mm-hmm. course there's the repair process, right? And Which kind I of, love. Yes. Yeah. Like I, you come back together, simple. you talk it through, you learn from it, you feel closer. But I just don't think it's realistic or healthy to put mm-hmm. these expectations that we we never react or just be human with our kids totally. when it's a difficult moment. Well, it's yes. and I call it coping out loud for the parent where it's an opportunity for them to model, you know, okay, here I am and they can catch themselves mm-hmm. themselves out loud there's my cat through the process of collecting themselves and handling yeah. the situation well. That's right. I mean, I love in, you know, as you talk about in the book as well, this the opportunity to redo and repair. I love nothing more than a redo. Uh, we have two floors. The amount of times that I have gone down the stairs annoyed and then walked right back up and said, OK, I'm going to redo. I mean, my children regularly because I'll bolt down the stairs. I'm feeling overwhelmed, frustrated. I'm going to say something I regret. I'm telling you guys I'm going downstairs because I don't want to say something that I'll regret. And then I walk back up the stairs and just the act of walking up and down the stairs helps me to regulate. And I go, okay, let me try this again. So important. And I think one of the pieces that I was thinking about as I was reading your book is this idea that because it's so complicated, this way of parenting to avoid this and avoid those feelings and don't do this because that we feel so incompetent that parenting becomes very inauthentic. Like we're not real. It's not me anymore. It's this other version of me that I don't know how to do. And so that sense of mastery around parenting goes. That's why there's, I don't know how many thousands of books. And I love the fact that you speak so openly about, you know, translating the research into day to day because it's so freaking complicated. Apparently you're not supposed to say that according to, to my eldest Freaking is off the charts, oh. but um, <laughs> but you know. It's what so are you supposed to say? I don't know. He's recently <laughs> been telling me, "No, Mama, you can't say that." I was like, "Oh, okay, all right, then something." <laughs> all right, moving um, well, on. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, that sense of yeah, it just gets really, really difficult. And so, putting into practice, reading all these thousands of self-help books and parenting books trying to get it right so gets in the way of our relationship of our sense of joy out of parenting it just sucks it dry of that and our kids see that you know I think we forget it's this is the life's dirty little irony that (laughs) in our intention and efforts to be quote-unquote the best parents we're actually really letting down our kids by putting all this pressure on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that actually makes us less responsive to our kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're less in the moment and open to what's going on with them. If we're so wrapped up in, am I doing this right? Is this good enough? And I love Emma that you bring up the idea of incompetence, you know, and this whole, I mean, how many times do we hear or say, I'm such a bad mom or I'm such a bad parent. I didn't make it to my kid's soccer game or whatever this tiny little thing is. But we are constantly internalizing, you know, judgment around our parenting based on not measuring up to all this expertise, which, you know, the mission in my writing is to counter the most popular quote unquote expertise, because it's not fully science based, in my opinion. And it's not, it's not healthy for parents. And that's my big concern. And then that affects the children, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so true. One of the things that Emma and I were exploring a while back was the idea of kind and wicked environment. A kind environment is one in which the contingencies are pretty clear. I do this and then this happens. A wicked environment, it's, you know, not quite so clear, you know, and parenting is definitely a wicked environment where we're doing things that we have no idea. Have I scarred my child for right. life? And this will show up on his, you know, in his therapy, you know, 20 years from now, or is this something he's not even going to remember? 
and but but it'll be there somewhere in his the tissue of his yeah. brain, you know, embodied or whatever. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, it's there's just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of doubt, yes. and that translates into a lot of anxiety and a lot of tension. Trying to script yes. it. Yes, so true. And it's such a tragedy that it doesn't even work. As in, here we are working so hard, and the irony, like you were saying, is that actually when we think about outcomes, it doesn't lead to better outcomes for our children, which is so sad. We're, and, and it's really not very enjoyable having to work right. so hard at it. And, and you mentioned that a lot, of, a lot of your book is based on self-determination theory. Can you mm-hmm. briefly explain that to people who have no idea what that is? Yeah. And, all, you know, I got my PhD in clinical psychology and I didn't remember it. So <laughs> it was like discovering it again. And I felt like, oh, I should know this as a psychologist. But self-determination mm-hmm. theory is the idea. And it's more than an idea. It's been studied around the globe, cross-culturally. And supported that there are three fundamental human needs for us to feel satisfied with our lives and psychologically healthy. And that is autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So autonomy, which actually is, I think, harder to define than people realize. I think people associate autonomy with being independent or just being able to do what I want. But it's more than that. There is a sense of freedom with independence, but it's also really understanding who you are and how you, like what your rights are in the world in addition to how to respect the rights of others. So it's not this free for all. I'm autonomous, so I get to act how I want. It's this sense of here is how I fit in the world and how I connect with others in a responsible, respectful way. So it's having a sense of agency and a sense of mastery in the world. And then competence, I think, is the easiest one for people to wrap their heads around. It's this just idea of feeling like I have skills, I have abilities, I'm confident, I've got it, you know, which parenting is not full of feeling competent, as you mentioned, Emma. And then relatedness is that sense of connection in relationship, a sense of belonging in community, and that kind of emotional safety. And so in the literature, that relatedness piece is really the foundation for autonomy and competence to bloom. So there needs to be that sense of emotional safety and connection to then promote the autonomy and competence. So in parenting, we are the building that first experience of relatedness with our children. And autonomy supportive parenting is nurturing those three fundamental human needs in our children. So we are working to raise autonomous, competent, connected kids by using autonomy supportive parenting framework. Nice. Yeah, it really is. And I think as, as, I was reading the book, I was, and I, we're having this conversation today. I think the complexity as parents is that in order to promote that autonomy in our children, we need to get really good at sitting with a ton of feelings because yeah. these feelings are real. This, this, these worries about, am I doing a good enough job? Are they going to be okay? Should I be investing in their therapy fund? You know, that, so those worries are real and, 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 I was thinking about it this weekend, this, this, you know, I can't remember when William Stixrod wrote his books, The Self-Driven Child. And, and so some of that autonomy piece is there. Chris, I remember you introducing me to him many moons ago. And this idea that, you know, as we let our children grow, um, I loved the let go and let grow that you speak. I think that's a fantastic and it encapsulates the complexity of parenting. Um, that when we when we let them go, there's a lot of feelings to that. That autonomy piece of our children. Obviously, there's the anxiety and the guilt that we're talking about, but there's also a bit of grief and sadness. Mm-hmm. And and I was struck by that this weekend. And and um, 
Chris and I, we've talked about it many, many times, how as soon as you sort of have your child, you start letting go, letting them go. I had an incident this 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 weekend where I was thinking about our podcast and I was thinking, wow, this is why it's so hard. My, my, I have a 10 year old and we went away for the weekend, but he has, he takes football very seriously. And his team basically said to him, if you go away, you'll be dropped out of the team at 10. So here we are the night before we have to leave. And this is what they say to him. And my husband was like, this is insane. You're leaving the team. They can't do this to you. Did you have his agent call? And you know. <laughs> Exactly. I knew, honestly, honestly. And so Franz was, was, was adamant. You just cannot be controlled in this way. You're 10 years old. Of course, you're coming away. And he, they're in the middle of the season and he got quite upset. And then we decided, actually, let's just take a moment. This is a big decision to be making tonight. You know, just take a moment. And he said, I'm staying. So he did. He stayed. We left. So two days into his trip, he stayed with a friend. And then he said, mommy, I'm going to go home and I'm going to spend my, the day on my own. This is on the Sunday. So he's traveling home and he realizes that he's lost his bag with all his stuff. And he calls me and he's in a bit of a state and he has 1% left in his phone on his phone. He goes, I don't know where I've left the bag. It's in one of two places. And I could hear his worry and the phone dies. And I was filled with dread. Like I'm in another country. I have no phone contact. He is here looking for his bag. He doesn't know where it is. And I just felt this, this ache in my heart and I just had to wait. I had to wait for him to eventually get home, charge his phone and call me. And it was about three hours later that he called me. And in that time, this is very him, he found his bag, he went and got himself lunch, got home, charged his phone, switched on the TV and called me. How did he feel after? I'm so curious. Did he express how he felt after it was done? Yeah, he was relieved that he found his bag and was delighted to be having his takeaway lunch in his movie. And he spent the day alone at home with his feet up. He was delighted. Yeah, right. and, and I noticed that my inability to take care of him and look after him and make things right was so hard. Like there was a, a, a Like I wasn't doing my job as a parent. And there was a part of me that I noticed I had to let go of the needing to protect him. And that was really like there was the, it was a grief. It was I can't he doesn't need me in a way. Well, we, I think he probably did, but he did really quite well without me. He didn't really need me. He succeeded. So, yes, I think part of the journey is the letting go from a letting go of our kids. Like they, they, they slowly leave us. And that's the right thing to do. Well, well I can tell you that it doesn't end. Emma knows my son, Ian, who is 29. And this summer, he took a solo trip up to Alaska. And he arrived in Anchorage and was having trouble renting a car and called and was saying, you know, what do I do? And and I was going to fly from Seattle to to Anchorage (laughs) and help him rent a car and decided, well, that was ridiculous. So he figured out (laughs) what to do. Had a lovely time up there and and all that. But yeah, I was going to like hop on a plane. Um, Yeah, we have that. I mean, it is a hardwired impulse, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, our job is to protect our children so they survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like evolutionary that it's a really strong impulse to make sure they're okay. It's just that in our modern day, those impulses are not matched with the actual threat. You know, they're not on the savannah being chased by tigers. (laughs) They're on a bus with a dead cell phone. Exactly. But I think, oh my gosh, both of these examples just bring up so, so much. I think so much common experiences of parents these days. I think the, actually the existence of cell phones has really heightened the mm. this pull to be immediately available at all times and so when you had this experience where you could not have mm-hmm. that connection via a cell phone i mean in the 80s that would have that's normal right mm-hmm. we would go hours without connecting 
But nowadays that's not normal. And so it's very anxiety provoking to not have that. Oh yeah. Assurance. Oh yeah. He he's not answering the text I sent like five minutes ago. <laughs> well, yes. And I've actually my children, my daughters who are both in middle school, will text me throughout the day, even though they're not Ooh. supposed to have their phones. And I intentionally do not respond immediately, even if I can, because I want them to realize I am not <laughs> there back and call and they need to figure things out because let me tell you it is never an emergency so (laughs) I think there's also that like what habits are we perpetuating Mm -hmm. in terms of the expectations of us always being at the ready and I I really want to touch on something Emma that you brought up that I think is really important in terms of why parents can have a hard time letting go and I think that is our how it feels really good to be needed. By mm. our children. And there Incredible. is something so validating when our children need us and it's painful when they mm-hmm. stop needing us. Absolutely. And I think some parents who aren't aware that that's actually happening internally mm. are doing things to pull their kids back close that's to true. them when developmentally they need to be separating. Yes. yes. And I think that needs to be more explicit because it is painful. I'd like, yeah. it really feels like I've been grieving from the yep. day that they were born. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, since they've been out of my, my, my womb, they've started to go and that's the right thing. I mean, the it fact is. that, that, you know, Nico could cope without me hurts and it's amazing. It's amazing. Amazing. And what yeah. confidence that built in him. I mean, That's what right. an incredible experience for him to believe in himself. And when he is in another situation that he hasn't planned for, he knows he can figure it out. I mean, that's, that's a right. true gift. That's right. Well, And that's the self-esteem piece. Mm-hmm. The best definition of good self-esteem I ever heard was somebody said, self, good self-esteem comes when we value the products of our actions. And if we're not acting, there's right. there are no products, <laughs> no products, we can't value them. So mm-hmm. by allowing our kids to, to act and, and even, you know, make mistakes, um, you know, they survive, they learn, and that boosts their self-esteem in a, in a way that's not artificial. It's very meaningful. And it is coming back to self-determination theory. It's their competence, their right. belief mm-hmm. in their competence. I started the book with an anecdote from my own parenting experience. I am very fortunate to have my oldest child have a an extremely strong drive for autonomy. So mm-hmm. she has taught me quite a bit and pushed me to really confront my controlling impulses. And with her, you know, she was the first of our kids to have a cell phone. She was the first to go into middle school. I remember literally it was days after her 12th birthday that I felt like she just vanished in our Mm -hmm. house and didn't want to be around us anymore. And that Mm -hmm. sense of grief and anxiety about what is she doing and is she okay not being around us was a big process. And with the cell phone, what it was such a journey because I followed the expert guidance around limiting the cell phone time and monitoring her use. And what happened is with her personality, it turned into constant conflict. And I realized I had this epiphany that this is harming our relationship more than what might happen with quote unquote, too much time on the cell phone. And I had to really reevaluate what is the purpose of these limits that I'm placing, you know, they're kind of arbitrary, to be honest. And is it my way of feeling like I'm being a responsible, good parent? I kind of feel judged to go out there and say, my 12 year old doesn't have cell phone limits, right? Like, and, but we came, you know, we had some good conversations with being, you know, really open. And I had to really let some stuff go on my end and be flexible in ways that I didn't expect. And when we came to an agreement 
that she did not, we would no longer check her screen time on her cell phone. And she needed to show that she was continuing to live a balanced life. Because in my mind, I realized my fear is that she's going to just get holed up on her cell phone. And and it's not going to be good for her mental health. That was my fear. And so once I realized that's what was driving this conflict for me, I realized I need to give her a chance to show that she can handle it. And so I was very clear with her. These are the expectations. If you want this freedom, then this is the responsibility piece. You do your chores. You know, you are around the family sometimes. You see your friends in person. You keep up with your schoolwork. So these are kind of my proxies of a balanced, healthy life. And that pivot just I felt the shift in our relationship mm. at a really critical time. I mean, a 12-year-old girl is a very critical time <laughs> in terms of how do you maintain trust, openness, and connection while supporting their need to separate and experiment and live their inner lives in a new way, but still wanting you to, f- I wanted to still feel like a safe place to come back to for her. And mm. so I share this story because it goes against, you know, all the guidelines out there. I had a lot of anxiety about it and it ended up being the best thing for our relationship. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That's, that's exactly right. And I think that the, the priority around the relationship, especially as they fight for autonomy is so key because that's the time where it's most difficult in a way in the parenting journey. And yet the relationship is ultimately the most important part. Like when, you know, as you talk about it in in the book, you know, when we try to control, it's often through coercion and that erodes the relationship. It erodes the connection. And and the phone has become such a weapon in parenting, I think. I mean, in my practice, it's constant. We just take the phone away. You know, any transgression, any problem, it's an immediate, you lost your phone. And I think it just sets up, it puts so much focus on the cell phone as like this divider between a parent and child, right? And such a point of power struggle. So, and and if I could just interject that the relationship, you know, preserving the relationship doesn't mean I'm I must have my child like me, mm. you know, because the coercion yeah. can go both ways. Where the child, you know, if you don't buy me this, I'm gonna like, you know, do whatever, mm. and it's like, oh no no no, don't do that. You can have whatever you want. So there's and that's a tricky balance and. So, yeah, we, we have to maintain that mutually respectful relationship. Right. And, you know, it was a chance with letting go of those limits with her. And it was clear, though, that if we had concerns, we would go back to having more limits, you know. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just, a, okay, fine, you can have what you want. Yeah, <laughs> there, yeah. there were expectations attached to it. And more than expectations, there's a lot of discussion, you know, mm-hmm. this and that's where I think the magic happens, right, is being able to com- continue to communicate about it. This wasn't just one discussion. You know, mm-hmm. we keep talking about what's going on on TikTok, like what are the trends happening and what are you noticing if you use it too much? And You know, there's just conversations. But I think she feels safe expressing things because I'm not going to just take her phone away, you know, as an automatic response. Okay, one of my supervisors once said, you know, the conversation is the punishment. It's like, can we stop talking about this now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah that, there is a danger with that, especially in this, in my household. It's like my sons, I have two boys and a daughter. Okay. My eldest is very chatty. We talk a lot, but then he also starts going, okay, enough. Now it's enough talking about this. Okay, mom, we've had enough of a conversation. Right. Um, especially with psychologist parents. I know. That's we right. Like to- we'd like to talk things through and make sense of things. It's, it's, it's very funny, but. I was just thinking as you were talking about this, this as we were talking about this, the control piece, and and you talk about it in the book. This now, like some children are just naturally autonomous, like you said, your daughter is, and so that makes parenting a lot easier. Like you can have these open conversations, and in some ways, it's easier, but it's only easier if you are okay with her being autonomous. Because yep. if we have a natural, it's kind of this kind of mismatch of temperament. 
like if we're naturally quite controlling as parents, and some parents are more anxious, are, you know, want to be more involved. I remember speaking to someone who felt that the ultimate sign of, of, of competence in life was if you were fantastic at your job and you had very successful children. It was like that was a proper badge of success. Right. And so for them, their children was an extension of them in every right. way, in their academic success, in their behavior, in how they looked. And so they couldn't let go of, yeah. of, of how the children behaved, etc. And so they were very controlling. And so for them to learn to step back was incredibly difficult, much harder than for me. I loved your use of the term lazy parenting. You know, <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm being a really lazy parent because I sit back and let them, you know, do their thing. But that comes more naturally to me because of my temperament than maybe somebody else who's more concerned about what their bedroom looks like or, you know, right. how they're doing at school. And so I think as, as parents, we have to be mindful of what we bring into the relationship too. You know, not just about parenting skills, but our personality. Absolutely. And the fit, you know, we talk all the mm -hmm. time in child psychology, right? And parenting, goodness of fit, you know, what's happening in the dynamic between the parent and the child. And some are easier than others. And just being aware of that. And of course, each child does need something slightly or significantly different, depending mm -hmm. on who they are and how they came into the world. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I feel like back to the current parenting guidance and all the memes and all of that oversimplifying parenting, I think the other byproduct of that has been that if our kids are acting up or having a hard day or having a big emotion, that that is somehow a referendum on our parenting and that it's because we're not doing something right. That's right. Yes. And okay. so then that puts more pressure on the child that we feel like they always need to be okay mm -hmm. and or else we're doing something wrong. So it's back to that pressure cooker. So well, in, in, in my clinical practice, when I would meet with parents and I'd say, you know, what are we hoping to achieve? Uh, invariably, parents would say, I want him or her to be happy. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, that's nice. The temporary <laughs> emotion. <laughs> yeah, very, and very fleeting and infrequent, but okay. But if my child is happy, then I can relax and I feel like yeah. I, I, I'm doing okay. If my child's yeah. unhappy, then it's like, this is a problem I need to fix as opposed to, exactly. you know, a condition of the present circumstances. Right. Yeah. I would say that, you know, in the time I spent researching and writing my book and learning so much about autonomy, supportive parenting, I really felt a shift in my own parenting, becoming mm -hmm. more aware and just seeing what had maybe been happening more automatically or unconsciously really seeing it play out and realizing in the moments I'm not I am undermining my child's sense of agency in this moment and for what reason you know even very simple changes like well what do you think should happen next instead of me telling them what's going to happen next you know getting their input asking questions to get them thinking and be part of the process whether it's about what their afternoon routine is going to look like or, you know, what a consequence might be for breaking a rule. And I think there were just these little shifts that kept happening for me as I wrote this book that I really realized, you know, the autonomy supportive parenting mindset is about being curious mm -hmm. and open and flexible. Mm -hmm. And then there are these strategies that follow that have been tested across more than 30 years of research that really have shown boost the magic ingredient for all of this is internal motivation for the kids, right? So when we are offering them choices and giving them rationales for why we're doing things a certain way, involving them in decision making, really making them part of the process, respecting their sense of agency as we're parenting, they are more internally motivated mm -hmm. to to do things how, you know, that's important to them. So for example, instead of us saying you should get all A's and do well in school, they're learning in their own way. Hey, you know what? It's important to do well in school if I want to do 
this in my future, you know, so it's their drive instead of our drive. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of the work of Jerry Patterson at the Oregon Social Learning Center, 40 years of studying families. And, and he said, there are three messages you want to give your kids three times a day for each of these messages. One is you're important. One mm-hmm. is you have good ideas. And the third is you can do it. Oh, I love that. So we find ways of just giving these messages to our kids so that, yeah, we do include them. We do ask, and and you mentioned, you know, asking open-ended questions and trying to get them to think a little bit and consider the possibilities and forge ahead. So, yeah, that that gets us in in the time remaining with, so what do we do about this? You know, what are some of those strategies? Right. So... So I think first I mentioned the mindset. So it's having this idea of coming to our kids, especially in tough moments where instead of going straight to our reaction, we can think to ourselves, what is going on with them right now? You know, and what is this like for them? And again, we can, this isn't about us, right? Like take, like depersonalize what's happening, which helps us be less reactive and then showing them empathy. This is one of the one of the autonomy supportive strategies is showing empathy and taking their perspective. And to take their perspective, we need to understand their experience and ask them these open-ended questions about what's going on for them. So those are always the starting points, right? The empathy and perspective taking. They feel validated. They feel understood. And then it's other ways of building their their feelings of competence in a tough situation. So those are things like going through choices with them and collaborating with them around problem solving. So not fixing it for them, getting their ideas about solutions, if the situation even calls for solutions. And a big one is expecting independence. And this is where parents think they're doing this more than they are. And we really need to be paying attention to are we allowing enough opportunity for our kids to be to be showing independence, testing their own independence? Mm. And what goes along with that is expressing trust mm. that they can do it, that they can. So what might be an example of thinking we're giving them independence when in fact we're not? Well, okay, so a lot of parents say, I want to raise responsible children who... Um, help around the house, but there's never been a chore expected. Yeah. I love that statistic that you shared. The, the one, why don't you say it? It's so good. So it's basically flipped. So like when we were growing up, it was over 80% of us grew up doing chores. And now it's like 28% of kids are expected to do chores. That's incredible. And just, right. Thinking about the messaging of that, of they're not contributing to the house or the space or the family environment. And it's usually because they have so many activities and academics are so important, but it's that messaging of, well, their needs are more important than the family needs. Like the individual needs come first and then the parents get to run around and do everything. Mm -hmm. So, so that's an example of a disconnect between I think parenting values of, Oh, I want responsible kid, but then not, giving the actual opportunity to build that sense of responsibility because they do things for their child. And because it's quite effortful, like all of this autonomy sort of supportive parenting piece requires quite a bit of effort in the short run. Yes. Especially if you're changing course, right? It's an investment. And I, I can speak to it. You know, we've been doing chores now for like four years and more systematically And it's amazing. I mean, my girls do their laundry. I don't touch it. My girls, you know, because they're now 14 and 12, they make all their food, you know, Mm -hmm. essentially. They deal with their lunches and their breakfasts. And, you know, they help with dinner. Each of them once once a week does dinner and the dishes. And I keep telling them, you are going to be so set up in college. Like, you're going to be. That's right. It's so good, though. I mean, it's so important because we, you know, we, there are conversations about kids going to college and really struggling yep. with that independence piece because yes. there are all these skills that they haven't learned to do because they've been incredibly busy 
great, you know, studying and doing these incredible, you know, activities, but not learning how to put their alarm and put the laundry on and get themselves from A to B on time and organizing their bags the night before, whatever it might be. Those are key pieces that when you go to college, you need to be able to do. I think a strategy we can use now, you know, if someone's listening and saying, well, what do I do today? I think one is noticing the impulse to rescue your child from a situation, no matter how small the situation, just notice it. They're asking me to help them. Do they really need my help? Or could I flip it back to them and say, I think you can figure this out. Just looking for these smaller opportunities for them to build their confidence and to show that you trust in them. And to do that, parents need to be able to sit with those feelings of the urgency and the anxiety and the uncertainty and all that and take take some deep breaths, you know, whatever you need to do, but but see what happens. And Mm -hmm. more often than not, I think as you've discovered and as the research suggests, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Everyone's going to be okay. Yeah. No, and I, th- I think parents, uh, you know, often feel like before they send their child off to the university or the world that the child has to be completely formed and completely competent. Yeah. And so many people learn a lot of lessons, you know, in college or in their 20s right. when they get their first job or whatever. And right. mom and dad aren't there to bail them out and they have to step up. So that anxiety of letting your kid go off and worrying that they're not going to like do their laundry or get to class on time and somehow they figure it out. But yeah, yeah, it's very anxiety provoking. So to finish up, Emily, can you say a few words about self-compassion? That's Mm. really, Em and I are big on (laughs) self-compassion. I love it too. And I love it in the culture of parenting right now is you know, recognizing how much as parents these days we are holding and carrying and this world can be quite a scary place in many ways. And we are doing the best we can and we don't need to be this ideal parent and whatever is being portrayed as that. And I think, you know, I talk in the book about how we're all parenting on a continuum every day Mm -hmm. and that we shift from being more controlling to more autonomy supportive based on our own stress, based on our child's stress. You know, this is a transactional experience Mm -hmm. and to have grace for ourselves on those days that are just harder, you know, and there are going to be days that you're like, well, I was pretty controlling today. And that's okay. You know, this is not a, this is not an identity. This is not you are or you are not an autonomy supportive parent. This Mm -hmm. is, I wake up every day and I want to practice autonomy supportive parenting to the best of my ability today. And it's never done. It's never over. You know, you've never lost your chance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's being open to that growth and change and self-awareness. And we know that the more we use self-compassion, the more likely we are to actually grow and change Mm, in positive directions. Excellent. I think that's a good place to to finish. So, Emily Edlin, thank you so much. Again, the book is Autonomy Supportive Parenting, Reduce Parental Burnout, and Raise Competent, Confident Children. Thank you Mm. so much. Thank you for the talk today. Yes, real privilege. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning into the Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast. If you have any feedback for us or secrets for future episodes, you can email us at Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Life's Dirty Little Secrets or on Facebook at Life's Dirty Little Secrets podcast. We invite you to follow, rate and review us on wherever you listen to this podcast. It is the best way to get our podcast out in front of new listeners. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with more. See, See you, you then. then.